Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you once again. You're going to hear this quite a few times over this week. Welcome to the Department of Materials and welcome to the University of Manchester for those that are joining for the first time. My name is Sarah Cartmel and I'm head of the department and I'd like to open this invitational lecture series tonight. Thank you all for coming out on your Tuesday evening. Um, I'd just like a bit of show of hands because I know we're quite a mixed audience. So if we just have a show of hands for those of you who are undergraduates. Okay. okay, thank you. And then those of you who are on a master's, a taught program, postgraduate degree. And then those of you that are on a, a postgraduate research degree, so that might be an MPhil, MC by Research, PhD. So there's a few in the audience. Thank you very much. And then last show of hands, okay, just to show the diversity in the audience, show of hands for who's in material science engineering program degrees. Okay. And then those who are on fashion business technology. Okay. All right, thank you very much. That's really just to give our speakers an idea of who to direct their eye contact to with certain subjects, okay? And just to show yourselves um, who, you know, the diversity that's in the room. We have a variety of different uh, degree stages, whether or not people are studying taught degree, already into their research project, postgraduates. And of course, we have a, a plethora of different degrees offered over fashion, fashion business, marketing, technology, and material sciences across corrosion, textile technology, biomaterials, uh, polymers, um, uh, and composites, for example. I would like to open up the series. We have our first speaker. We have Professor Jao Monseca. This is his inaugural presentation. So he, he did chair this year. So congratulations to Jao. And he's going to be telling us. He's going to be telling us about the art of bending metals. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm going to just put the microphone on because I like to wonder. Okay, so. Uh, you will stop in this way. If, you, if you're a bit hard of hearing like myself, you can still hear me when at the back. Can you, is this working? No? This doesn't work? Uh, I have to turn it on first? Okay. Does this work? Yes. Okay. So you can hear me better now as I go around. Okay. Very good. So... I had a very short course on how to run this beforehand, so I'm about to break everything. So here we go. I'm going to turn my coffee on, and then I'm ready to run. Okay. So, hello everyone. So thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, I'm Jean Fonseca, and I want to talk to you about the art of bending metals uh, and the people that do it. Right, the people that bend metals. There's quite a few of us, and. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And uh, this is an, an inaugural lecture, and to be honest, I have no idea. I've been to a couple, and they're all different. Some people like to talk about themselves and you know, the story that they've had and how they got to where they are and all the, you know, the difficulties that they went through. You know, it's hard work. Uh, other people talk about their science, right? Because, you know, why not? It's a great opportunity. You have a captive audience. You can talk about whatever you like. Why not talk about your science? So I didn't really know what to do. Okay, that, that was my issue. So I, I looked around and I thought about it and I thought, well, first of all, I'm not going to tell you about my story and how I became a professor of mechanical metallurgy, right? And the reason I'm not going to talk to you about this is because of this. Does anyone know this diagram? Yeah? Do you know the story behind it? That's it. So before you spoil the story, right, I, I will, I'll ask you for the punchline, all right? So, so this is what happened, right? So this is, is actually not real data, but this, this is a representation of all the bombers during World War II that would come back from, from the bombing missions. They would come back and they would land, right? Am, am I right? Yeah. So you correct me if I'm right. They would land and they would tra trace where all the bullet holes were in the bomber, right? Uh, and so the engineers looked at this and they got this nice map and they said, oh, it's brilliant because bombs seem to hit, you know, in the edges of the wings, and they seem to hit kind of at the bottom here, so we should reinforce all these areas, okay, because then, right, that's where the bullets are aiming for, obviously, right, but there was, an in, there was a mathematician, do you remember his name? That's the bit I can't remember either, right, I know he was Hungarian, 
So I know he was Hungarian, and, and um, he actually thought, wait a minute, no. The reason why we don't have any airplanes without holes here and here, it's because those never come back, right? So the airplanes, they got shot in those areas, never come back. So actually where we need to put reinforcement is here. So we need to learn the lesson from the planes that never came back. So because I made it, right, and, and it's the same thing if you buy a book by Bill Gates or any successful millionaire, all those people, they're the ones that came back with, and they might tell you about their bullet holes and so on, but they're not the stories to listen to, right? The stories to listen to are the ones that didn't make it, right? Because they have all the, they tell you about the barriers that stop them from making it, okay? So it's not very useful for me to talk to you about my story. But I felt I have to kind of justify something because I just went recently to a high school reunion. It was um, many years ago that I graduated from high school. And um, we, when I told, I told my colleagues, they were all saying, oh, what do you do? You know, oh, I'm a musician, oh, I'm a film director, I'm, I work at the UN, and they asked me what I do. I said, well, I'm a professor of metallurgy. And there was this silence, right? <laughs> real silence. And I, I felt like I was disappointing my colleagues, right? And, you know, no one said anything. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. And until someone, someone Stoller, who always, you know, he, he always says whatever, he says, so, surely we know everything there is to know about metals by now, right? Well, what on earth are you doing? Right? And I think, you know, I, I know where he comes from, right? So I asked him, then what do you think I should be doing? And, and because they remember me, I, I was into physics and so on, they thought, I don't know, nanotechnology, right? Something like that. Oh, you really like particle physics, so maybe you work at CERN, some kind of particle accelerator or whatever. Maybe that's what you'd be doing. Or maybe even supercomputers, right? They were, they were, the computers were very kind of new thing when I was studying, but, you know, I was really into them. And, and they thought those are the kind of things that I would be doing. But it turns out, that, no, I'm a professor of mechanical metallurgy. So I thought about it, you know, is, is this such a disappointment? Why, why, what is wrong with it, right? And uh, so I'll tell you why I got into metallurgy. Why not? Okay? And this is why, right? Thor. All right? So Thor has got a, is a mythical, is a god, right? Uh, from uh, the Norse myths. And he's also, but actually I have to say I didn't read the Norse myths. I was reading the comics, obviously. Uh, and he's got a hammer, right? Mjolnir. That was forged in, in these caverns, right? By these special... Uh, race of dwarfs, right, that, uh, and because of it, and because the material that is forged in, it's got these amazing properties, right, and I always thought that that's so cool, because it, I think it blends this kind of old mythology with the strength, and, you know, and Thor's a good guy, right, he's, he saves everyone, he's immortal, he's a god, he's full of muscles, like me, right, that's, that's, that's what I was thinking, right, I was thinking that that's, that, that's, that's what, I, what, what I want to do, and so, uh, when I was doing a PhD, when I was doing material science, I did material science like a lot, like some of you, uh, and I decided that uh, towards the end of it, that metals were, were, were the thing for me. Uh, and when I started looking into metals, what I realized is that metals are kind of otherworldly, right? They actually belong to something like Thor, because did you know, right, that whereas we, the carbon that we're made of and the hydrogen and so on, we also have metals inside us, but the carbon and stuff, is made kind of in stars. We all know we're stardust and all that stuff, right? But metals are made in supernovas, right? You can only make metals in supernovas. So metals are kind of slightly apart. And in fact, some metals like gold, you need neutron stars to come together, it seems, right, to make them. And so that makes them kind of special, I think. And, and I think when you start thinking about metals in the way they behave, they are just weird and kind of not they're not, they're not, they just don't belong to a different planet. So, for example, look at this. So, this looks like a science fiction movie, but it's not. The sound is not working. I don't think. Oh, maybe later. So, right. So, this looks like the future, doesn't it? Right. This could be Avengers in the future, and you're flying around, but it's not. Right. This is actually the tallest building in the world. Okay. Uh, and it's possible because of metals. Okay. This is only possible because of met only metals are capable of these kind of structures. There's no other way you can make this. Or this one, right?
So that, those jet engines, that whole airplane, right? Even though more and more we start using composites and other lightweight materials, the skeleton of it is all made of metal and titanium alloys, right? It would just not be possible, right? A lot of you wouldn't be here, right? If it wasn't for metals. And it's this thing, it's, it's pervasive. Metals are everywhere and that's why we think we know everything about them, right? A little bit like, I don't know, uh, agriculture, right? We think agriculture, everyone knows. But actually, agriculture is big business, and there's a lot of technology in agriculture, and the same thing with metals, right? And it's not just the fact that they are useful and they do these amazing things. Metals are crystals. Did you know that? Did you know metals are crystals? And they, right? They've got like, they, they don't have healing powers, right? They're not, not that kind of crystal, all right? But metals, all the metals you look around, right? This, this here is crystal. Right, that's, that's crystal. Okay, did you know that? And of course, this is, this is not a metal, uh, but this, this is a metal crystal. Do you, have you ever seen anything like this before? No? I'll give you a clue. This is not very far away, right? If you walk out the door and walk 100 meters that way, you'll see it because it's the back of this uh, cooler, right? And if you look careful in those beams across, you see crystals of zinc. Right, that came from the galvanizers to protect the corrosion. So they're actually made of crystals, right? All these metals, even though they're dull and, and, and they've got that kind of metallic shape. If you take a bit of copper and you grind it and put it in the microscope, this is what you see. Can anyone tell me what that is? Come on, if you're a first year PhD student doing metallurgy, you know what that is. You've seen lots of them. They're scratches, right? Because it's what you see, you abrade, you grind, and you get full of scratches. Right? You can't see anything, only see scratches. So what you do is you polish a bit better, right? You get the polish, and you, and then it looks like this, right? Because you polished in metal, you know, it's shiny and reflective. But then, if you put it in some acid, you start developing some some of these things, right? And you start seeing the crystals that make up copper. And copper is quite cool because it's got these weird shaped crystals. But the most beautiful one, I think, is still aluminium, right? So that's aluminium, anodized aluminium, looks like stained glass window, right? What we do there is we grow little bits of oxide on top of the aluminium grains, and because of their different thicknesses, they give you different colors when you use polarized light, okay? So just, they're, they're just beautiful. So once you start knowing them and get to know them, I think it's very hard to uh, stop working on them. What about this one? This looks like something that's alive. Right? Like some kind of eggs. Yeah. This is a nickel super alloy. So in that jet engine that was landing, the bit of metal in the middle that was holding the blades together, and hopefully not letting them fry away, if you put it in a microscope, it looks like this. Okay? You have little crystals inside, nanometer sized crystals, right? That make the material stronger even as it gets hotter. Right? And that's why airplanes and jet engines are possible. Right? The kinds of things we have would not be possible without these metals. Okay, so I think crystals are one part of it, and they make it very special because they give metals its properties. The other weird thing goes down to physics. So if you don't do physics or never done physics, here's your chance to learn a little bit about the physics of metals. Okay, the spheres are the kind of the centers of the atoms. The red bits are electrons moving around, and you know they move around very much. But the thing about metals is that they're very democratic with their bonding. Right? Very democratic. They share the electrons, like, one of my electron is your electron is your electron, right? They don't, it's completely shared throughout, throughout the metals. And that gives it special properties when they have to deform, when you bend them, when you hit them, when they land, right? That gives them very special properties. It's still very stiff, right? So metals are very hard to bend, which is quite reassuring when you're on a bridge. But at the same time, They've got just the right properties that, that if you hit them with something, they do not crack. Okay? And the reason for this is, so this, what we've done is we've taken a metal, put it in a microscope, and the lines are like the faces of the crystal, right? So if you imagine the crystal's got little faces, so if you zoom in to the atomic side, this is what you see, a face of a crystal or a face of a crystal. And you can see, well, if you try and count out from the bottom to the top, at some point there's one missing, right? There's a kind of a defect in the crystal. And because of this kind of very democratic distribution of electrons, metals don't mind. They like defects. 
because actually not only helps them kind of accommodate, if you hit them, they take up the blow, these defects grow and they take up the blow, but they also make it stronger at the same time. Okay, so they self-heal. And you can see the move as well. I don't know if you can see this very well, you can't see this. But there's a, a movie of some of these, those are the same defects, but moving in the crystal. We've thinned the metal really thin, and you can see them in the crystal. Anyway, so you have metals like that, and you have metals that are with the defects. And those are the two things that make metals possible. But I have to ask you one thing. Which metal is the strongest, right? Anyone want to say what metal is the strongest? Strongest metal in the world. Imagine your, your quora, you know, strongest metal in the world. Okay? Titanium. That's what I say. Right? It's, not, it's not true. But it is... Okay, let's go back one step. Do you think it's a, it's a pure metal that is the strongest? No, right? Why not? Why is a pure metal not the strongest? What, what is the strongest? It's not pure metal. What do you call something that is, that's made of metal, but it's not pure metal? An alloy, right? So what you need is an alloy. So metals, they're quite a nice... So you can make very pure metal, but usually it's very weak. So metals get strength from kind of bringing in elements that are not like them, right? That's the idea. They don't quite fit in, but actually that interacts with the way they deform and that makes them stronger. And super alloys, like the one I show you, have got like 20 elements added to it, okay? And they all do a job. 20 elements added together, that's what makes a super alloy. So how do you add them together? You melt it like something like this, right? So you have to make a big furnace, and most times, that's what you do. You melt, and you pour it down, and then you can make a mold of it, whatever you want. But often... <laughs> This day, right? So you, so Thor and his hammer, the old near, that was forged, right? And this wasn't, this was a long, long time ago, right? Time immemorial it was forged. We still forge to this day, okay? And the reason why we forge is then when, when you cast stuff, so when you grab some metal and you just pour it out, you have lots of problems, okay? You have segregation. The alloys, instead of mixing around, they stick together, right? No good. You have holes, right? Look, this, this, is a, this is a cast material that's been cut in the middle. And you've got holes right in the middle, going all the way down. You don't want to make uh, Mjolnir's hammer out of that. So what you do when you forge is you close up those pores, and you also change those grains. Okay, so if, if you squeeze them, and you add lots of those defects into the metal, and then hit it up, this is what happens. So, what I'm going to show you next is that microstructure. So it's that aluminium, right? And we put it in the microscope and we heated it up to see what happens. Right? You want to see ready? So that's what it is, all beat up. We heat it up and look what happens. Right? So we have new crystals growing in the, in the beat up crystals that are completely free of defects or almost free of defects. Right? So this heat, this beating and reheating is really important to get the right properties. Okay? And that explains a lot of the stuff that we still do at the moment. It's all about understanding how all this happens. And then you think, but wait a minute. Ha, you're doomed because now we have 3D printing. Right? That's it. <laughs>
last layer made. And then you can do another one, and then you can do another one. Right? So basically what you're doing is melting little bits of material one at a time. Okay? Now, what that does is it gives you almost any shape you like, but at every one of those points you have a little cast pool like you saw earlier. Right? You have a little weld. Right? So actually what you're trying to do is make airplanes out of little welds. And I've met many engineers of airplanes and structural engineers, and none of them ever said, let's make the whole thing out of welds. Because welds are always a big problem. Right? So 3D printing is really exciting, but actually, it's a really difficult process to get right. For some metals, it really works well. Right? For titanium alloys, for example, it really works well. And that's because, I'll show you a nice example. Uh, when you cool down titanium, this is what happens. Naturally, you get needles of crystals growing into each other, right? like needles of ice crystals that grow into each other. And they are very strong from the beginning. But with many other alloys, it's really, really difficult to do. Okay? So we still will continue to beat metal up right, with the forge to get the right properties. OK, so I think at this time, what I will do is I will talk a little bit about what we actually do here. So we, this is what we, we worry about these things, but we do things a little bit different. So we'll look at microtokens like this one. OK, so this alloy is used in nuclear power plants. It's zirconium based. And you can, can you see the little crystals? So the colors just help you differentiate the little crystals. And they have fractal properties. Okay? So because of the way the, these materials change phase, you end up with fractal crystals. There's always smaller crystals inside, smaller crystals inside, smaller crystals inside, smaller crystals. Right? Up until you get this at a very small size. When you then bash them and beat them and forge them, this is what happens to them. Okay? So now what we've done is the dark phase, we, we made some bits black, so we just have one of the one type of crystal left. But you can see how the crystals have been stretched and broken up, right, and elongated. Okay? This is the kind of stuff that we look at. And we try to understand why they end up in the shape they do, because they give us the properties. The other thing we do is we go to a place like this. Does anyone know what this is? Synchrotron, right? So it's a big particle accelerator. At the synchrotron, we accelerate electrons to 99.9999569s at the speed of light, right? So the electrons are going round, and then we use magnets to slow them down very quickly. And because they're going so fast, they emit light just forwards, right? They're very, very bright beam of light forwards. Because as far as electrons going at speed of light are concerned, the whole space-time has collapsed in front of them. Okay, so there's only light that comes out in front of them. And we can do it, we can shine it at our materials when they're being forged. So this is one material that's being forged, and you can see this is what we get, right? So what happens is the planes and the crystals, the laughs and the crystals, are giving you, are acting like mirrors, and you can see, what you can see is, in the middle, explaining what you can see, in the middle, you've got some, a few rings, okay, this come from one kind of crystal, there you go. Then what we're doing is we're cooling it down, and that's producing those crystals you saw earlier, and they give you all the other rings. And we can do this very fast, so we can actually, when we're forging, seeing what's happening inside, inside the material. So the other thing we do is we play with these. Okay, so if you think about all those defects moving around, all those crystals, how they interact with each other, right? I'm afraid my brain is too small to get it all in, and so we need some help, right? And so we, we use supercomputers to do this. Okay, we run big jobs. Uh, we, have, we have a few here, we run them, some in the big facility, and we do things like this, right? So we do mathematics. We use mathematics to represent our crystals, and we use computers to put our assumptions in there. So we might have an idea, right? We might have an idea about what's causing this to why they are deforming the way they're doing. We can put it in our mathematical models, and we can work out if they're right. Okay? So the other thing we do is we measure the deformation, which is actually quite difficult. You saw how difficult it was to see those, those, that movie earlier and that I kind of skipped through. It's really difficult to see this. So what we do is we use nanotechnology to produce a very, very fine pattern 
of gold nanoparticles. So these are all made of gold. And what we do is we deposit it on top of our material. And then, as the material deforms, it leaves these traces. Okay? So what you see here is like the wake of these defects moving past these immaterial deforms. This is the same nickel superalloy you saw earlier. You can, can you recognize the crystal shapes? Maybe when we zoom out again, you can see. So that's one crystal. And you can see the traces of the defects that have gone through. And as we zoom out, you can see how you have all these beautiful patterns everywhere. So that's one of the surprising things that we found when we started doing lots of this experiment. Is that everywhere we looked at metals and how they deform, they always form these patterns. This was very different from what I learned when I was an undergraduate student, when I always thought there's defects just moving around the crystal. But the patterns, no one told me about the patterns. Okay? Uh, and so it was very surprising. When, I, when we first saw these results, I really thought I discovered something amazingly new. Okay? But it turns out we, we knew about patterns already. So this problem that we're working on, right, movement dislocations, was studied by Sir Alan Cottrell, who was advisor to the government and scientific advisor during the time of nuclear power. Uh, and this, is, this, this work hardening is one of the problems that we worry about. So these defects are the reason why if you take a bit of metal and you start bending it, it gets harder and harder and harder until eventually it breaks. Okay? So that work hardening is a very complex mechanism. And as he says, you know, they will probably be the last one to solve. This is difficult, this turbulence. It's very complex, multi-scale, right? Very, very difficult problem to solve. Uh, and he, he did a lot of work. And when you study, you study material science, you will hear Cottrell because he's got lots of mechanisms named after him. Okay? He was that important a guy, right? And he was, he was brilliant, to be honest. There's no other way to, to say it. And so it looks like we'll have a job for a while, right? Because we're still trying to understand what's going on. But what I also discovered uh, was that actually, by doing all these things that I'm doing and working on these difficult problems, I'm actually doing everything that my classmates thought I was doing, right? I'm doing nanotechnology. I'm using supercomputers. I'm using particle accelerators, right? So actually, right? It's called metallurgy, but this is what I really do. Well, and marking, right? And the other thing, it's very useful, right? And that's, I think, something that is, is you know, I, I don't think about it very much. But anything, any little improvement that we do in how we understand our metals or we make them a little bit better or we, you know, this is immediately very useful because we use them everywhere, right? These alloys, these are used everywhere by everyone. So it doesn't take much of an improvement to have a huge impact. Right? It's very different from working on a, a new material, say, that maybe if you get it to work one day, it will be used by people. Right? Everything we do is used by people every day. Right? So I feel quite useful, right? which, is, which is quite nice. Um, but I wanted to say something before I finish, which is that it turns out there's also someone called Doris kuhlman Vilsdorf, who also saw lots of patterns right, during her investigations. Right? And those patterns look a lot like the ones we found. Right? So when I started, eventually, I found a book. Right? And, and I wondered, why did I never hear this name in my textbooks? Right? When I was, when I was uh, at university, we never had this name. Right? And, and she's written so many papers. They're very cited. So other people think her work is very important. And it turns out she was an inventor. She had her own company. She made brushes for motors. Right? She was very successful. Uh, and yet, metallurgist, right? and we never heard of her. And uh, I, read, I read lots of her papers. And in one paper, is the reason why she, she, so she's talking about her theory. And she talks about this theory that explains these patterns and why they appear. And she says that there was, there's never been an invited paper on my, my method right? At, at this big conference, which still goes on, by the way. Then worse, there was this big dislocations conference, right? and I was omitted from the mailing list by a claimed error. Right? She was never invited to come to this conference. Okay? 
And on protest, she was permitted to deliver a post deadline paper, which was presented last but one last paper of the conference, and in spite of several cancelled papers that left awkward gaps in the program, she was put last anyway. And next, the organizer refused the inclusion of this writer's written submission in the conference proceedings, saying the paper was too political. Okay? And then later, it was submitted to the same journal. That happens very often. If you have a conference, sometimes the papers go as one issue, part of the conference, but then you can submit to the same journal separately. And it was accepted. And not only that, there were complimentary comments. Okay? It was really good work. Okay? So that, that, that gets me thinking, right? Because I think that that's the issue. So what we have, right, when, when someone makes professor and so on, you look to their stories. What we really need to do instead is look for the people that we're kind of not letting in, right? So that's just one example of the people, right, that never actually, well, in, case, in this case, I mean, this was such a phenomenal woman, right, that she was very successful anyway. But in the field, we don't, you know, a lot of people don't, don't, don't know about her. So this is it, right? I'm a professor now. In 2016, 17, there were 19,000 UK professors, okay? And one in four are women, okay? Right? Only one in four. But there's actually two in four women, usually, more or less, on average, in this country. So there's some women missing, right? Only 95 black men out of 19,000 professors. Okay. And if you're black and a woman, only 25 black women out of 19,000 professors. Okay. So this is the reason why I say you shouldn't focus on my story. Okay. Because, you know, I'm white, I'm a man, I, uh, everything going for me. Okay. Really. I'm handsome. Right. <laughs> So, you know, you modest, thank you. And so, you know, but, right, you need to look at the stories. And, and I'll just give you some tips. So, for example, if you don't know if you're on Twitter, if you're not, you should follow Jess Wade. Jess Wade puts up Wikipedia entries for, for women scientists primarily or, or scientists of uh, unrepresented backgrounds on Wikipedia. She puts one up every day. You can help her by doing that. But if you follow her, you can learn all about these amazing women scientists that just no one talks about, right? Like Doris Kuhlman, those of them. Uh, we can follow Tiger and STEM. There's, there's several groups like this one on Twitter. They are really keen and doing the best, the best they can to try and improve the diversity in, in academia in general. Okay? Uh, and you can, read, you can join the Institute of Materials and get Materials World, right? But I was really, really delighted to see the materials were, uh, in the past couple of months, it had a really nice article on fighting and diversity and equality in STEM, and one about uh, being a gay person in STEM, okay? I know very few gay professors, right? Might be that there aren't many, but actually there must be some. Maybe they don't feel very comfortable about being gay. And, um, and yeah, so you can do this. Uh, if you're British, you should probably also Oops, sorry. If you're British, you probably should also vote. Did you know that if you're a British student, you can register to vote here and at home with your parents? Right? You can only vote in one place, but you can register in both places. Okay? That's really important. Right? Do that. You guys seem to know what you're doing, so vote. Okay? That's, that's very important. And, uh, but I would say one thing before I finish this. You are already very lucky because if you look around, the University of Manchester is one of the most diverse universities in the country, okay? We get people from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of the world. The University of Manchester really cares about diversity. I know the people that work in widening participation and so on, and they really, really care about making this an inclusive place and a place for everyone. So what I'd ask you is that I could just look around and talk to people that are not like you, right, and interact and learn about their stories. Okay, that's a good start. Because the problems that we have, the reason why we don't have so many women and so on, it's not because uh, the women don't like science and so on, it's just because the culture is the way it is. But we are the culture, right? We are the people that can change things. 
So the people that bend metals are known as special people. They're us. Right? We bend metals. We study genes. We study all this. We're all the scientists. We're people. Right? And we need to look after ourselves and we need to change this. Because I think, like alloys, we're stronger when we're, we've got diversity amongst us. And actually, there's a lot of evidence that that's true. So anyway, there's only one thing that makes me almost as sad as the lack of diversity in the professoriate in the UK. And that's this. So I went to see Avengers Endgame. Did you go to see Avengers Endgame? And at some point, uh, this evil sister breaks Thor's hammer, right? Irreparably broken, OK? Just, it looks like plastic to me. But anyway, irreparably broken. But then it turns out, and actually I remember this because I'd, I'd read the comic. It turns out what he gets is he gets a, an axe called Stormbreaker, right? That's forged in the heart of a star, right? I just thought, this is, no, they're not going to do this. Are they really going to do this? This is like all my dreams come true, right? I'm going to see this, okay, it's not Mjolnir, but it's Stormbreaker being forged in the heart of a star, right? And I'm going to share with you that scene, right? Because I was so excited. The whole film, we're like, oh, come on, come on, right? So this is what happens. Oh, Father's given me strength. You understand, boy? You're about to take the full force of a star. It'll kill you. Only if I die. Yes. That's what killing you means. Disappointing, really. Did you see any forging? That axe is cast. It's not forged. It's cast. It's full of pores, full of segregation, right? Really bad grain structure. That axe will just, it's no good. So that's why I'm never watching any more Avengers movies ever. <laughs> you know? I know that. You know, he's a, you know, he's, of course he's a god, he can survive the power of a star, but get cast axe? Sorry, I can't do it. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.
you, Jao, for a very inspiring presentation. I guess my only concern after that lecture is that we're going to get all of our students now conversing to do metallurgy <laughs> and away from some of our other materials. So thank you very much. Um, so Jao is not only a superhero that's going to be teaching, on, uh, teaching you in our materials department. We have another presentation soon from 